welcome to our By the Book YouTube channel. I'm absolutely delighted today to have the wonderful Joe Spain join me. Um, and Joe is about to release her 11th book later on this year, uh, The Last to Disappear. So, Joe, you might just uh, quickly introduce yourself to anyone who's watching. Well, I'm, I'm Joe Spain, and I'm a full time writer and screenwriter from Dublin. Um, I've written the Detective Tom Reynolds crime series, which is six novels and four standalones. This will be the fifth this year. Um, and I write quite a bit of TV as well. So that's me. Yeah, no, it's um, I was actually reading up on you today and I'm so impressed at like everything you've managed to fit in um, since 2015. Would that be correct? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Um, so we're talking seven years, we're talking 11 books. Um, a lot of them were obviously bestsellers. Um, but I'm equally as impressed with your um, involvement in TV um, and writing for TV such as Taken Down. Um, you might just kind of, I suppose, tell us as well a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, well, the books came first. Um, yeah. Obviously, it is um, hard to earn a living in the book world solely at the yes. start of your career and I wanted to leave work and write full-time so I was wondering if I could I guess in the same way that I thought maybe writing a book would help me become a full-time writer I was like well maybe I'll just write for tv <laughs> like like these things are easy <laughs> and particularly to transition between I didn't realize at the time that um just because you can write doesn't mean you can write in every type of writing and screenwriting and books are night and day but I am one of the lucky few who's able to move between the two of them with ease. And it's quite a, I mean, I, I, I can't praise myself for it because I'm obviously just born with it. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's something you have or you don't have. Mm -hmm. um, but TV is, it's a really well-paid way of writing, but okay. it is more of a collaborative. You do work with teams, whereas books you write in your own. And I never, people always ask me which one I prefer. And I, I never can quite say, I think it's whatever I'm doing in the moment is the mm -hmm. one that, to do um but so far I've managed to I mean I've gone down from two books a year to one book a year because it was impossible mm -hmm. to do two yeah after a certain point so there was I think my busiest year might have been 2019 or 2020 when I did two books and two tv shows at the same time and that was yes. horrific <laughs> mm, I can imagine and I have as well noticed you've got four children yeah so yeah so busy busy house I can imagine um I'd love to go back in time um with you so 2015 I know that you uh, entered the Richie and Judy competition and I suppose uh, the talent was obviously there um but you know in some ways it was your lucky break um with your first book uh, with our blessing but could you just take us back before that happened and um, what were you doing what was your life like um, had you thought about writing at all and that transition into I suppose becoming a full-time author yeah um well I mean I've always enjoyed writing I've, I've written since I was a child but I grew up in a very working class area and I did not think that writing was something you could make a career from it you know it's it felt to me like fun and I think when you grow up working class you see most people's jobs aren't fun. Most people's jobs are work and it's just keep your head above water. And I just, I mean, I know I didn't want to have that kind of job, but I was going to go to college and get a very sensible job that paid the bills and, and that was going to be my future. And I ended up working, I did politics um, in Trinity College and I ended up working in Leinster House. I was working with uh, Pierre Starty as his political advisor. So there was a lot of writing involved in what I did you know, speeches and parliamentary questions and things like that. But I never lost that desire to write fiction. And I think when you talk to people who've achieved something in a field, which seems kind of unusual, you'll often find that they had it quite young and they were never able to let it go. So it's not like I woke up one day and thought, I'm going to write a book. I've wanted to write a book for as long as I can remember or write something. I just didn't quite know how to go about it. So I was working in Leinster House and um, I was there through the whole kind of Troika IMF period. And I, my, my background is also economics. And I ended up working very long hours, very exciting, interesting time to work in Irish politics, but also quite exhausting when you take in the commute in and out of Dublin City Centre. And I was having babies all along and I did want to try and find something that would let me work from home. But. It was I mean, this was kind of I started thinking this just coming out of the last recession and it was impossible to think what could work. So I decided to write a novel and 
I mean, that could have been for most people that just amounts to nothing. <laughs> you, know, you write a book and it just sits there in your shelf. But mm-hmm. because I'm quite a logical brain, I was thinking I'll write this and then I'll do submissions letters to all agents and I buy the writers and artist year book and I'll find who's publishing this type of you know crime fiction genre, and I'll do this very strategically. And I I wrote the book over say 2014 after work in the evening with babies there. And then I saw the Richard and Judy competition and sent it in and thought no more about it and just kept going to my day job and thinking, look, if that doesn't succeed, I'll do another one. You know, I'll try something else. Mm-hmm. And that one got shortlisted. So, wow. And I was offered within six months of that book being shortlisted, I was offered a two book deal with a publishing house in London, a Quirkus, a really well-established publishing house. So in terms mm-hmm. of the road to publishing, I mean, you don't get much more seamless than that road. And people might think, well, you know, that was kind of easy. But I guess when you take into account the fact that I had a full-time job and at that point, four children, and I was writing it at night, it didn't feel easy. Mm, (laughs) I can imagine. And had you undertaken any creative writing courses, um, you know, to get that novel I mean, to be able to compete at that level and to be shortlisted among thousands. What what was your um, secret <laughs> to, you know, to being able to stand out? Do you think? Do you think it was the story? Do you think it was the way you wrote? Um, Everybody wants a secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did I did not do creative writing courses. And okay. I, I do a lot of talks in schools now. And I always say to the kids, um, if you want to write, possibly the best advice I can give you is to live your life don't leave school and go into college in some kind of creative writing field because I think the best writers are people who have lived lives and can absorb things into their novels you know if you if you consciously try to write a novel that's going to do well it's it's the old cliche of you write for yourself and if you have talent and skill and writing ability what you write for yourself will be very readable to other people so I mean I liked crime fiction I, I've always read crime fiction I like crime fiction on tv and there was never a question that I was going to write crime fiction but I also took a subject that I knew a lot about my dad had been born in a mother and baby home okay and I decided to set my first crime novel against the background of those mother and baby homes and I because I'd done so much research on those just for personal reasons I was like an authority on it you know so I could take from it and write about that world and I read books all the time. So I knew what I had to hit for this book to be read. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be published, but I knew for other people to enjoy reading it, there's a standard of writing. And I knew that from reading other books. And that was, it was as simple as that. I didn't need anyone to lecture me in that. I just knew from reading what something had to look like. And if you're, if you're harsh on yourself, most people can get there. You know, most people don't we're not all those really bad singers in the X Factor who go on and go, what do you mean I can't sing? (laughs) You know, like, you know, if you can write or you can't write. And sometimes, and I say this to people as well, what's good is not always recognized as good. You know, sometimes somebody might read your work and think that's not for me, but that doesn't mean it's not good work. Mm -hmm. And if you really struggle to string a sentence together or tell a story in real life, you're going to struggle writing and you either have it or you don't you know it's very hard to teach that to somebody how to tell mm-hmm. the story well yeah and you just mentioned your dad there had had anyone in your family written before you or were you the first to go down this okay honestly yeah you were the first and, and they're all readers so my okay. first book launch was absolutely massive and I remember the Irish publishers at the time were like, oh, how do you know so many people? And I was like, well, that whole side there is just family. <laughs> wow. Um, and your dad, so your dad, um, when you were doing the research then for the mother and baby homes, how did he feel about that um, at the time? He had actually passed away. He died when I was 16. Oh, sorry. Um, but, yeah, no, no it's, it's fine. It was a long time ago. But he had a very troubled life because he was born into the mother and baby homes. Mm. Um, he, he had addictions because he never, he didn't know he was adopted in the way that we know now he was adopted. Um, and he wasn't adopted till he was five. And that's one of the homes that was included in the, the institutional abuse for the children as well. Mm. Um, so he must have had a very rough start. And that's, I became interested in his life long before I ever became interested in writing. And when I wrote it, I mean, the, the book is crime fiction. It, you know, it's, it's not meant to be anything deeper than that, but it does have as a background a very deep and sensitive subject. 
which I am all too well aware of, because I think the thing with modern baby homes is that it affects the mother, it affects the children, but there's also a legacy effect. Like I, I didn't have my dad walking me up the aisle at my wedding, you know, mm. things like that. My, my children don't know their granddad. So it goes on down the line. And I brought that sensitivity into that book. And I think that's what got such a reaction to it. And it's something, I suppose that's a tip as well for people. My publishers read that and hadn't read anything like that before because it was a story particular to Ireland. It was a story particular to me that I was able to use as a backdrop and they were you know, taken aback with that. Mm. that. That does tend to be when they get millions of books across their desks. Mm. If something's quite unique like that, it stands out to them, you know. And like people contacted me from all over the country and all over the world then who'd been into these kind of homes. And it was at the same time as they, it was all becoming very topical in the news. The Magdalene Laundries had just kind of been almost dealt with in terms of redress, but they only started in modern baby homes. So people were all getting into it at that point. And even though I kept saying, look, it is just crime fiction, <laughs> it's not factual, it's not, you know, they were all, I think it gave it a boost. Mm, oh yeah, no, um, it was definitely coming out at the, around that time. And I suppose in some ways it was like leaving a little bit of a legacy for your dad. Um, yeah. I suppose, which is, which is actually lovely. I didn't know any of that. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, did you then feel pressure? You said, was it, was it a second book deal you got? Did you feel pressure then? Um, you know, given your first one was a success, did you feel, you know, or did you, were you just able to get on and write a second bestseller? I mean, I've never suffered from writer's block. I, I okay. honestly said a hand on heart. Like I've always had another idea, another idea. And I mean, that helps when you're in TV as well, because the likes of shows that I'm working on, it's a single episode per week. So you have to have a single plot per week, you know, so you're constantly coming up with these things. Um, but I will say my second book, um, I again used somewhere that I knew. So I was working, in, still working in Leinster House at the time and I decided to do a political crime. And I often look back and think if I had had the foresight that I have now, I wouldn't have done that because political crimes are divisive. When people pick up books, most crime fiction readers, um, there's lots of people loved it. Like it was one of the best reviews books that I'd done. I remember the, the reviewer in the, the Guardian of the Times in England was like, this is fantastic. And the insight into Irish politics is fantastic. But there were a lot of general readers who were like, I really struggle with the political backdrop of this book. You know, okay. they just didn't, I guess they'd either buy a political book or they wouldn't but they didn't buy a detective series to then read into something that featured and it wasn't it wasn't that it was overtly political it was actually just set in Leinster House and there was a minister and there was dodgy licenses involved you know that kind of thing but it turned people off and I went gung-ho at that even though my editor had said to me are you sure you want to base this in parliament so she obviously had an inkling mm-hmm. that would be a harder sell you know and the next book then you see was about a serial killer and women going missing and that just flew off the shelves <laughs> so I think okay. you know like I I've learned over the years to maybe not to rush into them and just to yep. st- I still always write the book I want to but sometimes mm-hmm. I have a few ideas in my head I'll, I'll go through them all and think okay what, what mm-hmm. will be better here yeah and all your books they seem to be quite <clears throat> different um different themes running through them um is that is that on purpose or yeah I mean I might run out of ideas one day and then they're all going to look the same (laughs) I think like I have to be interested in what I'm doing Mm. and I can't write the same thing that that's one of the problems with tv you're rewriting and rewriting the same scripts over and over and over and it just it's soul destroying you know it's it's a really well-paid job because it's soul destroying but on books it's just you and I have to enjoy the world and when I get a new idea like I I do make sure it's not like anything out there you know well you can never know for sure and you never know what somebody else is writing but I like to just in my own mind think okay that plot where have I seen that before have I seen it before is it original enough or if it's not original enough can I put a twist in it that that brings originality to an old idea and then I create characters that I want to sit with and generally because they're coming from my brain they are unique and what's happened every single time is that on each of the standalones they've just been so different that sometimes I've had to say to the publishers just just bear with me <laughs> because you, you you get an audience and they want to bring that audience back and if it's too different they're concerned that the audience won't come with you but they are all murder more or less you know so it, it, there is something there mm-hmm. but um, yeah so far it just has happened that I just have 
my, my brain just works in an odd way, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's obviously worked well for you. Um, yeah, because I, I was really struck with the diversity of titles, the diversity of stories, um, and also the fact that you have this TV um, experience as well. You know, I was, I was trying to wonder how can someone do that much varied work in seven years? Um, you know, it's quite incredible. I personally loved Taken Down. I thought it was brilliant. Um, can you tell me a bit about that and, and how that came about? Was that... A story you had and then went on the screen or was that specifically devised for tv uh, it was specifically devised um i met um at the time I'd, I'd wanted to start writing for tv and i'd met um jane gogan who was the head of drama at rt at the time and i i thought she'd wanted to adapt one of the books uh, as Stuart Carolyn who'd written Love Hate had sent my books to her and said you might be interested in this this girl you know so she's written good books and she was like, actually, what we're looking for is something very original. Could you do something very original? And I had had an inkling for a book that later turned out to be After the Fire, which is the sixth in the Tom Reynolds series. And it was about people, women being trafficked through Dublin. Mm -hmm. And I'd had that trafficking thing in my mind for a while. And I had that kind of plot. And I started thinking about direct provision centers. And I, I we knew at the time, because I'd never written for screen before, I'd have to write with somebody who had a little bit more experience than me. And Stuart Carroll was there. <laughs> I, was, I was like, would you consider doing this, you know? Um, and he, he was really into it as well. He was really into direct provision. He was really into the way refugees were being treated in Ireland. And we, I did up a plot and a treatment document and that went into RTE and I did a pilot and the, they just immediately said, yeah, we'll have that. And again, it was one of those weird, seamless. And then Stuart came aboard and, and we wrote the episodes together. But um, it, it, I don't know, it felt like the stars were aligning. And even as I'm saying this to you, the success of that book deal, the success of that TV show, I mean, only last week I got two rejections from American publishers for standalones that you need a different publisher in every country. And they just rejected them. One of the standalones was like, oh, it just didn't grab me. And the other one was like, yeah, we think there's enough out there in the market similar. So like you have these successes and then you have yeah. these slap in the face rejections just yeah. in case somebody's watching this and thinking, oh, sounds easy. <laughs> I know. And it's good to highlight that. And I might actually lead that into a question, um, which I asked some authors, which is obviously we've talked about some of the highs, um, but just maybe some of the low points that you've had um, since you started. Uh, I mean, I, I think in, in the book world in particular, there's more lows than highs, to be honest. Um, there's the, the low of first having to get your head around how much you earn as an author, because I remember a friend of mine saying, you know, and I would have taught this too, if one of your books sells for 10 euro, how much of that do you get? Do you get like five? <laughs> I was like, oh, if only, you know, and I had to explain that most people earn royalties of like 10%, mm. finding down to maybe four and a half percent if it's a supermarket sale. And even then, you don't know what the book's going to sell at. And it could be a 99p ebook or yeah. it could be a five euro deal in a supermarket, you know. So to actually make money from books, even if you were selling abroad and I've got, I think it's something like 18 territories now, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. No matter how prolific you are, and I'm, I'm quite prolific. Most people just write one a year, sometimes one every two years. And a lot of them are hoping for the TV adaptation deal. And again, um, one of my novels was optioned for TV a couple of years ago. Didn't go anywhere. I wasn't working long on TV at the time, so I was disappointed now. I'm on the other side of that and I get sent books to adapt all the time and I turn them down and I know I am turning them down and it's 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 a horrible every author thinks tv is going to make their book a success and so few tvs so few books get to tv so you get that little rejection all the time as well you know um and then it's I guess every time you bring out a book you're hoping it's going to be the massive number one worldwide bestseller and you might do like the I've had books go to number one in Ireland and not go number one anywhere else you know you never know where you're going to do well or not do well but I mean the the flip side of that is in tv my co-writer at the moment was working on his current project for like eight years before it got made and I have a book out every single year I have a product every single year and I can say look this is what I've done you know this is my my creation will you read it and I have that constant validation <laughs> which all, all writers kind of need of people reading it and going that's great I love it can I have another one mm -hmm. you know so compared to tv where you could be three four years trying to get something made with books there's an instant almost 
validation, you know, and, and people get in touch with you. And it's nice. And you get asked to do things like this, you know, where you're talking to people because most of the time you're on your own at home. Mm, I know it can be very but, tough. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on, I mean, I'm, I probably, I love people, which is why I write about people, but I can only be around people for any length of time. So it's a career that suits me well, but then every now and again, I'm like, I need to go find adults now. <laughs> mm. And you've a very supportive husband, Martin. Yeah, luckily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, because I am. Um, I've been finding you on Instagram for quite a while, and yeah, um, yeah. I think you're, you're. Well, I would encourage anyone to follow you. Your posts are, you know, they're <laughs> great, and I can see that you know it's side of your personality. And I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever seen you actually really post about the books much. <laughs> which is a good thing endless endless book stuff and then I thought you know I guess like I I've I've come back from Twitter and Facebook because you can I'm nearly too busy busy to do social media anymore Instagram I like because it is just photographs you know and I also find with Instagram if you don't push something at people all the time if they like you they'll Mm. find that you do you know so if I constantly kind of say here's my book here's my book here's my book people are like oh, just, just swipe on just swipe on but if, I, if I'm like here's lovely food and here's lovely flowers and here's our renovated house they're like, mm. that's, like that's a nice picture and sometimes they actually are more interested in what you're doing then yeah your house looks fab thank by you. the way thank you <laughs> is that is that all finished now no if okay. you've been following on Instagram you know the trials and tribulations of this house it, it's like oh we're getting there slowly but surely <laughs> yeah yeah and it's still in you're still in Dublin yeah we we yeah. moved I mean like 20 minutes away from our other house but a whole universe in terms of size like we were in a three bed and we moved to a five bed yeah but the way property prices in Ireland are we have to buy a house that we have to gut to live yeah. in so yeah um <laughs> and the other see the other question I have um which I ask all the authors is the advice that you would have for those starting out I think it's to it's without being kind of cliched is almost to be zen about it okay so you you want to enjoy everything about it like so few people get a book finished let alone a book published so if you've managed to get to the end of a novel and that's the biggest thing every time people come to me and say how do I write a book I'm like you write it you have to sit down and write like I can't give you you know if you're getting stuck maybe in the middle do a little plot sheet or whatever but only you can get to the end of that book and if you do you're already way ahead of everybody else if you manage to get published enjoy all the you know the little things that get sent your way the cover art the planning the launch all of that stuff is all fun but just take a step back from yourself and and tell yourself okay this might become a number one book everywhere or it might not and that's okay too because I can do another book and another book and I can keep this and I can make a career of this and I've noticed a distinct difference between so I've just written my 12th novel for next year. So you can say at this stage, I have a career in novels. Like I, I have an actual like product now at this stage. I've written novels. I'm, I'm established. I've seen over these seven years, so many Debbie writers come and go because their book either does well and the second one doesn't or their book doesn't do well. And they think, oh, and they're just gone. And they don't realize sometimes it, it can be the big success story. Other times it's like anyone learning their trade you get better and you get more established the longer you're around. And now when I bring out a book, it goes into every shop and I have a certain amount of sales in any case because I've built a following. So I'm glad I stuck with it. And I think that's the that's a very long winded way of saying stick with it, even if it doesn't just achieve success for you straight away. Mm, no, that's great advice. And you mentioned there you go to schools. Um, and is that to talk? Is that primary schools or a secretary? And is that to talk, that's obviously to talk about writing. Yeah, um, secondary school is kind of careers days. And I can't do it as much okay. as I, and I've turned, I turn down most writing, reading or, you know, speaking things now because I'm just so busy with the telly. Telly is like a full-time job. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I do get asked to go to schools, particularly if they're working class areas, I make a point of going if I can fit it, fit it in. Because I like to say to the kids, I come from Coolock in Dublin and I've written 12 novels and TV shows because they need to hear that, you know, like, I think they, yeah. they associate what I do with very, it's a very middle-class profession and I am beyond working class in terms of where I started. And I, I feel like I have to stand in front of them and say, that's where you can go. And anyone who makes it 
as a success from working class areas, I think we have this duty to go back and just remind them because you forget, even though people try to say we're not a particularly class society, we're not like England, there's still steps on the ladder in Ireland. And you forget sometimes how low down the ladder people are and there's a ceiling above them that they don't think they can break, whether it's psychological or financial, and they need to be told that they can break it. So that is my little bit of giving back. Oh, that's so lovely. Um, so if there are schools in working class areas, you're still you're still going to them or you're still open. You try and fit them in, I suppose. When I can, it's less and less. I just said my, my friend works as a teacher in a school there and she asked me to do it now. And I was like, I am have no availability in the next six months. <laughs> so. Yeah. So d- can you tell us a little bit about the next six months and what lies ahead? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we have. um Harry Wilde, a show I co on, that's airing at the moment. And we are prepping with our fingers crossed because nothing's greenlit yet for a season two of that show. Um, And Ms. Abma co-writer, we have seven shows between us. I've got this book out next May. I'm writing, sorry, sorry, Rachel. This is what, this is, this is real life. (laughs) This is like four children in the house. (laughs) This is is authentic now, seeing what it's like to write in my house. Yeah. I will, yeah, the other book I have out next year, I have that ready to go. So I'll be on copy edits. And then I've got another book to write before the end of the year. So at some point in the next six months, I'm going to have a holiday. Lovely. And outside of that, it's just endless amount of work. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that'll be book number 13 by the end of this year, or am yeah. I counting right? Yeah. 13. 13. Yeah. One look, you're lucky. We'll Incredible. <laughs> Such a fantastic crew, uh, Joe. Um, really appreciate your time because I know you are so busy. Um, but I definitely wanted to get chatting to you, especially because um, I know you've done both the TV world and the, the book world. And I know that's of interest. It's lovely to hear a little bit about your personal story and just around the first book and talking about your dad. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, if people want to follow you, Instagram um, is probably the place you're most active. If they want to see pictures of nice flowers and <laughs> champagne, yeah, definitely Instagram. Brilliant. And we can expect your book on the 12th of May. That's it. Which is, which is brilliant. Okay. Well, look, best of luck with everything. Um, I look forward to continuing to follow your success. And I wish you all the best in everything you do. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks, Joe.